And today, Ramon will be telling us all about Fork and Company recent advances, pitfalls, and future developments associated with this technique. All right, let's hear it. Thank you. Okay, thank you to the IRM for organizing this conference and inviting me and also the, um, the session conveners. So <clears throat> today I want to show you some, um, let's say, curiosities about FARC diagrams. So it's a kind of travel through signatures, FARC signatures. So FARC signatures are a sort of elemental um, unit in FARC diagrams that enable us to recognize uh, certain types of particles or certain types of magnetization processes. So FARC signature can be related to a certain types of particles or a certain magnetization process. And what defines a FARC signature or what do we need to define a FARC signature that we then put in, your, in our curiosity cabinet? We need reference materials which have certain typical properties. We, ne we need to get uh, maybe end members from numerical unmixing of natural materials. We need forward micromagnetic modeling and modeling of generic magnetization processes that give certain fingerprints in the FARC diagrams. So uh, putting for diagrams in relation with uh, other magnetic measurements, bulk magnetic measurements, uh, we land to the day plot. This is a representation of the day plot. And we have, of course, at two, let's say, end members, uh, which typical for characteristics, which are the single domain particles and the multi domain particles. And these are end members characterized by a very simple, in a certain way, behavior. Single domain particles have only one type of magnetic state. And uh, the switching between uh, this magnetic state and in its anti-parallel parallel version is giving, in case of non-interacting uniaxial particles, what we know to be a central ridge and a double, doublet of positive and negative amplitude in the lower quadrant. When we go to multi-domain particles, okay, we have a virtual infinite number of magnetic states, but they are also all the same. They just differ uh, practically in which spinning side is spinning which domain wall, basically. And in this case, the characteristic of the Fock diagram is to be practically limited to uh, to low cursivity and has a large vertical spread going from minor saturation to, uh, to plus saturation, uh, saturation field. But the interesting thing is actually all the complexity comes in between these two end members, let's say, like that. And we start with the end members that are closest to the single domain particles. So these two FARC diagrams are uh, uh, originates from uh, pelagic sediments, which has been uh, subjected to selective chemical dissolution to separate, in a certain sense, the signature of secondary magnetite particles, which are were grown in the sediment matrix from pri primary magnetic particles, which sometimes are embedded, for instance, in silicate or are very large. And as you can see here, this is the typical signature of magnetophosis. We have a central ridge, but we have also something that uh, has never been clarified completely. And this is this two kind of um, um, contribution above and below the central ridge. And we will discuss them uh, later. And we have also this lithogenic particles. In this case, uh, they are very fine particles, mostly also single domain but probably with other contribution as well. We see already that they are in the single domain range of the FARC diagram. And then we have a series uh, here of uh, assorted magnetites, which was prepared by, by Lasco and others from the North Atlantic. We see uh, magnetites of increasing sizes. And as you can see, 
in the smaller size, we have still the central ridge and we have this contributions above and below the central ridge. And as we grow to larger size, we see that the fault function is changing progressively. We have a central maximum that is moving towards the origin and we start to have a larger vertical spread. And we, so we continuously come to the multi-domain and member in a certain sense. So not only the, the, the bulk measurements here represented by the day diagram, but also fault diagrams are showing a transition and apparently continuous transition between the single domain and the multi-domain and members. However, this uh, is a false impression that there is a continuous transition. In reality, uh, there, is, there are specific magnetic states which define this single domain range. For instance, single vortex particles. And what distinguishes single vortex, vortex particles, as the name says, is that they contain a magnetic vortex. But the important thing is not that they contain a magnetic vortex per se, but that this is an additional magnetic state. So these particles have more than one type of magnetic states. And the interplay or the transition between these magnetic states are generating more complex uh, signatures. Here you see it. there is a central ridge like in the single domain particles, but there are also these lobes uh, above and below the central ridge is a more complex signature. And this led uh, Andrew Roberts and others in 2017 to invite us to revisit the concept of pseudo single domain particles is not just a container of undefined things, but it, it denotes actually a different, a distinct magnetic states, which are different from single domain and multi-domain. So it's, it's uh, a sort of domain state, uh, an extra domain state. So uh, here is a summary again uh, of this new picture that we have. Uh, but I, wanted to, I want to draw your attention to some uh, apparent contradictions or curiosity, which are uh, kind of strange. For instance, here we have these secondary magnetite particles, which are in size, uh, let's say, uh, have a maximum size of 100 nanometers, so they are predominantly single domain. We see, however, that there are these two lobes above and below the center ridge, which resemble those of single vortex particles. So the question is, yes, are magnetofossils, for instance, associated also with single vortex particles or what is the origin of this signature around the central edge, really? And also you see that while the true uh, single vortex signature does not contain negative contribution in this corner here, when we go to larger sizes, we start to see that there is a sort of negative contribution growing in the descending diagonal of the FARC diagram. And this signature is present in larger particles all the way up to multi-domain particles. And what is, for instance, this signature that survives over such a large uh, uh, range of sizes? So uh, beginning with uh, magnetofossils, which is one far, uh, thing that I have been investigating since some years. Uh, well, we, we, we don't know exactly what is the structure of magnetofossils in the sediment, simply because when we do a magnetic extraction and we look at them under the electron microscope, we have destroyed their original arrangement in the sediment. So we don't know exactly how these particles are dispersed in the sediment. So one of the first uh, uh, theory um, was that as soon as the cells of the bacteria dissolve, the chains uh, which are unstable will collapse and they will create clusters of single domain magnetite particles. And of course, this will be then particles which have dipolar interactions and they change their position in the day plot, they go down this way. However, if you look the position in the day diagram of this secondary magnetite, we see that it's very close to the ideal position 
uh, of non-interacting particles. So this cluster seems not to form. Anyway, it's interesting to look what, what happens at the end of this train. And you can see here, from one, on the one side, we have the classical feature of extracted magnetosomes, huge masses or clusters of, of single domain particles, which have the typical in signature for magnetostatic interactions. But the interesting thing is what happens with small clusters of magnetite particles, which are produced in bacteria that has been uh, damaged so that they are not capable of arranging the magnetosomes in chains. And in this case, these are genetically modified bacteria that produce uh, various forms of clusters. You see that they generate a FARC signature that is very close to the to the, to the single vortex particles. But of course, these are not single vortex particles. They are too small to host a magnetic vortex. vortex. What is seen here is a super vortex. So it's practically a flux closure arrangement of uh, the magnetic moments that eliminates the stray field. But uh, nevertheless, we, have, we see that the FARC signature is very similar to that of completely different particles. So a different point of view, view as on, on chain collapse or, or randomization has been taken by other authors. For instance, Chang and others modeled the fate of chains in the sediment by assuming that the chains will be randomized to a certain degree. So the magnetosomes will be displaced and they will be transformed into sorts of fractal clusters, which you can see here which are generated by a random walk mechanism. And in this case, the FARC diagram is preserving the central ridge as well as the lobes around the central ridge in the local CVD range, which resemble these lobes. So it seems that it's a quite successful description of what magnetophosis probably look like in the sediment. But look, the position in the day plot of this simulation. It's down there with a remanence ratio of 0 0.35. However, what we get from the sediment is close to 0 0.5. So this does not seem to be a correct description. At the end of this trend, that is actually what we obtained together with some colleagues from biology. Uh, we get the signature of bacteria that produce loops, magnetosome loops. You see them here. Again, these loops create flux, flux closure patterns, which have the signature of single vortex particles. So having these things in mind, uh, I started to model chains of magnetosomes, assuming that they will not collapse in the sediment. So they will preserve the original structure as produced by the magnetodactic bacteria. And these structures are actually very uh, different. So we have single stranded chains, which are usually chains that we see in bacteria that being, can be cultured in the laboratory. And these have the typical signature that we see also in measurements, nothing special. But we have also bacteria that produce double stranded chains or in general, chains with multiple strands. And in this case, these individual strands interact with each other and they will produce these lobes around the central ridge, which are also seen in natural magnetophosis. So you don't need to assume the chains get destroyed to have this signature. Also, if you think about an isolated chain, uh, if this chain, like this one, for instance, is bended below, beyond its elastic limit, it will snap together because the two ends, which have opposed magnetic polarity, will attract. And the double chain is generated. And this double chain has gained the same signature, these two lobes, than we have here. So actually putting together all these signatures, we get something that is vaguely similar to the natural signature, but most importantly, the trend maintains a high remanence ratio, like in classical single domain particles. And the reason is that these structures here, contrary to the structures that I have shown you before, 
maintain a strong uniaxial anisotropy. So this uniaxial anisotropy enable the single domain state of this uh, chains to be preserved even in zero field. And this gives the high remanence. And this has consequences, for instance, for FARC PCA results. Because if FARC principal component analysis is performed on, on marine sediments, for instance, you very often, of course, get uh, an end member that resemble that of uh, magnetofossil rich sediments. So it's interpreted as a signature of magnetofossils. And in this first work of Velasco and others, he got, he got one, one, one end member that contains all the characteristics of the magnetofossils and then other end members for the detrital magnetite particles present in the sediment. But there are other studies which have really interesting results. For instance, this one by Channel and others from the North Atlantic. So he got, he got an end member which this one looks like the trital magnetite in the PSD range, but look those two end members. These two end members look like the magnetofossil component decomposed in two. So the central ridge went into one end member and the lobes, which are typical of uh, multi-stranded chains got, got in another end member. And this is possible because if the relative abundance of single chains single-stranded chains versus multi-stranded chains is changing down core, then the PCA is actually reproducing this change by um, dividing the magnetofossil signature into two end members. That's a natural consequence of how the mathematics of PCA works. So actually what we are looking here is an environmental signal. There's a very interesting environmental signal, which is the ratio between a single chain producer producing bacteria and multi-stranded chain producing bacteria. We don't know, I spoke a lot with biologists, what makes the difference, uh, but of course these two types of bacteria occupy different ecological niches, and so there must be a hidden reason for these changes, which we will discover in the future. So here is a summary again now of this signature that we have encountered until now that belongs, let's say, to the PSD range. We have the true single vortex particles, but we have also many arrangements of single domain particles which produce virtually indis undistinguishable uh, uh, features that are almost identical to those of single vortex particles. So this is something to keep in mind when we look natural materials. Okay, now uh, the question is, because we have so, so, so drastically different systems that give the same FARC signature, what is this FARC signature really representing? And this is shown here by a simulation. It's not important now what it is going to be simulated here is just 1 million of particles which have a vortex signature, which have been simulated here. As a dashed line, you see the major hysteresis loop. You see a typical characteristics of this type of particles, which is a constriction of the loop. And superimposed to the loop, you see also this bluish uh, diagram, which is actually the superposition of the individual hysteresis loop of this one million of particles. So the darker region, the darker blue regions are regions that have more overlaps of these individual hysteresis loops. And this overlaps gives you an idea where is the magnetization of individual particles most of the time. And you can see that there is actually a lot um, of blue in the saturation range, obviously, but there is also some blue in regions we have, which have a low moment, magnetic moment. And this is more clearly seen here where only a subset of particles has been selected, which has a certain angle to the, to the applied field. And you see now that, and then this red curve now is the hysteresis curve of one of these particles. And now you see that the hysteresis loop contains a continuous portions, which represent reversible magnetization changes separated by jumps 
these jumps represent the transition from one type of magnetic state to the next type of magnetic states. And here we have two types of magnetic states. Uh, the set of high moment states, which are single domain like, which are visible in the saturation range, and low moment states, for instance, magnetic vortices. And now the question is how this uh, type of hysteresis generates this spark diagram. This can be easily shown. Let's start with the first forks which are measured, which are measured in reversal fields that starts above the first jump of the major hysteresis loop. All these forks are identical. And so because the fork diagram is a partial derivative of these curves, the, if these curves are identical, the partial derivative is zero and they don't contribute to the fork diagram. But if we decrease the reversal field to just be, uh, below the jump, the first jump, we will have a fork curve that starts from the low moment state. And now this curve has a different path. As we increase the field, you see first uh, the low moment increases with the field, and then we will have a sudden jump to the high moment state. The jump is labeled with one, and in the fork diagram is represented here. So this contributes to the upper lobe above the central ridge. And the other one million of particles contribute also near here as well. So if we now go to smaller reversal fields, as long as we stay in the region where we start from a low moment state, all the curves are identical again. And because they are identical, they do not contribute to the FARC diagram. But then we will eventually reach the second threshold where there is a magnetization jump. jump and the next curve starts from negative saturation. So we start with a high moment state. And when we increase the field, we will just then met a transition from the high moment state to the vortex states. This transition, which is labeled with two, is contributed to the lower lobe below the central ridge. As we continue to increase the field, we met the third transition where the low moment states is converted into a high moment state. And this is transition number three. It contributes, contributes to the central ridge. And finally, when we go to saturation, we will encounter the transition of the previous curve. But because it is the previous curve, this transition has now a negative sign. And this gives you the negative lobe above the central ridge, which is seen here. And if we go to smaller reversal fields, nothing changed anymore. The forks are again identical. And so these discrete magnetization charms produce these lobes and the central ridge that you can see here. Now, of course, uh, particles which are in the PSD range are, can be more complex, complex than that. So we can imagine to make the things a little bit, bit more general by considering particles that have more magnetic states. For instance, this system has two intermediate magnetic states, not only one, but two. There's two curves here. And this is the, so the positive saturation, one intermediate state, the other intermediate state, and negative saturation. Of course, the more states, discrete magnetic states you add, the more transition you have between the states and the fog diagrams gets correspondingly complex. So every, each difference between consecutive forks is a diagonal line in fog space. So we have three diagonal lines as difference between these four sets of curves. And along these diagonal lines, which are the traces of these curves, there are magnetic jumps, the ones that we saw before, positive jumps and negative jumps. And these jumps all together, when we have millions of them, uh, make the fork function. Now, uh, uh, Johan Lasko uh, and others uh, try to, to simulate uh, these PSD particles, for instance, in an obsidian sample with a focused ion beam and nanotomography, they got an exact shape of the particles. 
exact volumes, exactly defined volumes, which, which could be used for a micromagnetic simulation. And here you see the results of this micromagnetic simulation of this uh, few particles here. And you can see several jumps. And all these jumps, and this is the particularity, are contained into triangular region. In this triangular region is defined by the saturation field. The saturation field is the field positive or negative, where the major, the two branches of the major loop close, so where the hysteresis loop close. And all the, the transition or almost all of the transition which produce these jumps are contained between the negative and the positive saturation field. So you can imagine that if you continue this simulation for more and more particles, you will get a continuous spark distribution. So now we can go one step farther and make a real general model of what could be maybe the true nature of, PSD, of the PSD signature in what I call a maximum entropy model. So imagine, for instance, that you have a family of particles which have a saturation field of 100 millidecile. So the contributions of these particles to the FARC diagram is a set of discrete jumps, so each of these points, which is contained in a triangular region, which is limited by the 100 millitesla saturation field. Then we go to another set of particles, which has a lower saturation field, for instance, 60 millitesla. And we will have contributions in form of discrete peaks of these particles within a triangle, uh, which is defined by this 60 millitesla saturation field. And then a third family with 20 millitesla and contained into a smaller triangle, and so on. So what you see here, when we have many of these examples added together, is that the number of peaks increases as we move from outside to the origin of the FARC diagram. And actually, when we make this exercise go to infinity, we will get a continuous function, which has triangular contour lines. And I call this a maximum entropy model because in this model, we don't make any statement about where the individual transition occurs. They just occur between minus saturation field and plus saturation field. So there is no additional information contained in this. And this, since a statistical variable that is contained between two limits with a uniform distribution has a maximum entropy, this is a maximum entropy model. And actually, real FARC diagrams of PSD particles uh, bear some resemblances to this maximum entropy model. Here is volcanic ash, ash sample from Peru, especially in the upper um, uh, half of the FARC diagrams, you see that the contour lines are indeed triangular like in the maximum entropy model. But you also see that this does not work so well in the lower quadrant. In the lower quadrant, there are actually these negative contributions, which I have mentioned before, which are creating a sort of indentation in the contour lines, which is not seen in the maximum entropy model. So where does this come from? Actually, interestingly, it is possible to, for instance, simulate the existence of an internal field, a demagnetizing field, which is proportional to the magnetization. Let's assume that inside the particle, there is a demagnetizing field proportional to their magnetization. And we can calculate then the internal field and the FARC diagrams with respect to the internal field. And then we get this negative contribution here and the indentation of the contour lines as in the original, original model. Actually, the, 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 the coefficient that relates the field and the magnetization in this case is 0 0.17, assuming that this is magnetite. And 0 0.17 is too much for this to describe, for instance, a negative interaction field. So this is not the interaction between different PSD particles, but it's really a field that is inside the PSD particles, a demagnetizing field. And actually, the interesting thing is that you can see that in the original single vortex particles, this field does not seem to be present, but it starts to 
be present and, in, and be more visible as we go to larger particles and move to the multi-domain uh, multi end member. And uh, actually already Pike, I think in one of his paper of 2001, noticed that this negative thing here and also the center ridge in the multi-domain particles disappear if you anneal them. So apparently it has something to do with probably the distribution of defects uh, in the crystal when it is not annealed. But the thing is still very vague. So we would like to get a better insight into the origin of this. And so for this, we go back to our cabinet of curiosity and I will show you a monster from this cabinet. So this is the spark diagram here. So what would you guess it is? Probably some sort of PSD particles, magnetite, maybe it's 10 microns in size or something like this. Well, no, this are, is, is synthetic magnetite in the super paramagnetic single domain range. So very small particles. So how come that these particles produce a fog diagram like this? Probably these particles are fused together and probably they are actually, there are a lot of exchange inter interactions between the particles and exchange interactions, unlike magnetostatic interaction favor order structures, favor a long range order. And there's a long range order probably promotes some sort of vortex, super vortex structures across many of these particles. But I'm not showing you this example because it's misleading. We know already that this can happen, but because of a strange effects that occur in time, you can see here there's a label that is indicating time. In fact, I have measured this specimen uh, for 50 days, once every day. And you can see what happens as time goes on. So here it starts and you can see it's changing and, oh, sorry. And the negative diagonal here starts to develop of time. And also something in the central region of the fork diagram is changing. You see that the initial uh, single maximum of the fork function is divided into two maxima. And so this is the same sample. The relative positions of the particle is not changing. The size of the particle is not changing. So probably this feature is related to low temperature oxidation of these small magnetite particles. So what probably happens is that these particles develop an oxida oxidized rim, which, which itself probably produce a field that acts on the core like a demagnetizing field. So we can try, we can verify this hypothesis by taking the starting fog diagram, which was measured the first day after the sample was created and see if we can add an internal field and transform this original fog signature into the final one. So if you, we use a classical demagnetizing field that is proportional to the magnetization, things don't work very well. So we get a very, very, very small negative region. Actually, the, the color scale is exactly identical in all diagrams, so you can compare them. So we get a very small negative feature, but the, the problem is that the diagram expands terribly, and so this, the, its amplitude decreases. So it actually does not seem to work well. But now, because we might think that this, internal field is produced by the oxidized part, uh, maybe the oxidized shell of the particles, and the shell saturates. So its magnetization is not increasing forever, it will saturate. And so the field that this shell is, pro is producing is saturating. So we can replace this simple model with one where the field is saturating. S is a kind of sigmoidal function. And in this case, you can see that this negative diagonal is actually forming. And also we can see this doubling of the central maximum, which is also vaguely seen here. Of course, these two things are not perfectly identical, but it seems that things move to the right direction. 
So we can also see actually an interesting thing that I think it's worth studying in the future is that in this ESD range, we have a sort of interaction occurring between different parts maybe of the same particles. Parts that uh, contain well-defined magnetic states, let's say parts of the particles that we have rigidly in a magnetic sense, which have discrete transitions. Maybe for instance, this could be strongly pinned parts uh, with defects, or they could be corners of the particles. And we have the remaining volume of the particles which we have reversibly, it has a reversible magnetization, which is described by a sigmoidal function that interacts with the other part, producing this negative diagonal here. Okay, so now I'm coming uh, to the conclusions. So what we have seen today is a mix of uh, different things coming out from the curiosity cabinet. So we have good things. Uh, the major uh, fingerprints of domain states are resolved. So we, we can say that we understand different domain states of magnetite and their signatures with four diagrams. We pr probably don't understand the, the last, the, the smallest details, but the general features. Yes. The other good news is that magnetofossil signatures represent the true change geometry. They are not the result of some collapse or positive positional features, but the original, uh, the original chains as they were produced by magnetotactic bacteria. And this means that they bear a very interesting uh, environmental magnetic signal, environmental signal, which we cannot interpret yet. We don't have the key to do it. But if we get this key in the future, we can say very precise things about the, the positional environment. And also, we have a better discrimination between uh, the magnetic components because we know more details about them. So the bad things, one is a usual thing. Uh, as, as, as soon as you measure macroscopic magnetizations, the interpretation of this measurement is non-unique. And this is true for any types of measurement and also for fog diagrams. And we have seen that. We have seen completely different systems of magnetic particles producing exactly the same signature. In particular, single domain particles appear to be a true jolly in the world of magnetism because they are able to mimic uh, the signature of much larger particles if they are arranged in a certain way. So basically the key point in this case is how the single domain, if and how the single domain particles interact with each other and which type of interaction do they have magnetostatic or uh, exchange or both. And finally, the ugly, but this is only for those that are interested in applications. So for, for me, it's a lovely thing, but uh, in order to understand Fox signature, we need forward modeling. We, we, we need to, to make a hypothesis and say, okay, this might be produced by a certain type of particles and we need to model them. But of course, uh, micromagnetic modeling of, of forks is extremely time consuming, unfortunately. And also we need good reference material from a curiosity cabinet. This is very useful. It does not meet, need, need to be geologic material. For instance, the last example that I brought to you is, it was born by chance. It was just an error in doing something. And uh, it's a synthetic sample. And uh, this is probably the point that, that I would propose for discussion in the community. Uh, nowadays in science, nobody has time. We, we, have, we write projects that have very well, de very defined goals. Students have three years, they have to go through the projects like a rocket and they cannot uh, play too much uh, with details. But actually uh, each project may be uh, generates or, uh, some samples which are very interesting to be studied for a further study. And so it would be nice to have a curiosity cabinet. It would be nice to have this sample preserved and made available for the community, for somebody that has special uh, infrastructure, for instance, uh, electron microscopes to do 
many things that can be done today or to, to measure high precision fog diagrams and so on, and accumulate some knowledge and make some, let's say, reference fog diagrams that will help the interpretation uh, in the future of future projects. And with this, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much, Ramon, for that excellent talk. Um, went a little bit over time, so we only oh, have sorry. A, few minutes, <laughs> a few minutes for questions, um, but we'll go ahead and get started and any additional questions maybe people can ask during the break, um, which is after Clara's talk. All right, um, first up, we have a question from Wynn Williams. You wanna unmute? Uh, hi, what a, thanks. Uh, fantastic uh, talk. So, you know, I've got some good and bad and ugly things to say. <laughs> about folks as well, and maybe you can help me out. So, you know, we've been um, trying to identify these vortex signatures, and, and we there were some examples in that paper of Andy Roberts that um, I was a co-author in. And, and we used that, that work of Dumas that you, uh, I think you showed on slide 10 of your presentation. And it had a very nice vortex signature. The problem with that for me is that Dumas used uh, just a very specific direction of the magnetization when he did his simulations, right? A very specific direction of the magnetic field uh, with regard to the anisotropy axes of the particles. And um, the, the nucleation of a vortex, in my mind, uh, is slightly different from uh, the nucleation of a, of a single or, or coherent rotation in a single domain in that you have, I think, as you've said, uh, you get this um, a, a nucleation, a, pro, a, 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 a propagation of a vortex core from the edge of a grain to the center and a denucleation. And it's not always necessarily a very a dramatic shift, although you do see these switching fields as you demonstrated in your hysteresis, hysteresis uh, plots or, or par, uh, partial hysteresis. plots. And you can see those in any one uh, hysteresis with, with a, uh, applied field with respect to a particular anisotropy axis of grain. Now, if you had a random assemblage of those grains, the actual change in magnetization or, those, or the sudden drops or the sudden changes in magnetization are kind of blurred out. And the reason where I'm going with this, uh, Ramon, is that I've done all the vortex simulations as a function of grain size and elongation uh, across uh, most of the PSD grain size range. And I just cannot find this lovely signature that you see I would love to, and it may be that somehow the, the smoothing or something I've done wrong, but I, for whatever reason, this really clear signature that you have on here that you propose to single vortex particles, I do not see in magnetite. Now, it, it, with iron, maybe you see them in Gregite, I think, uh, as it published a paper with, uh, with um, Miguel, um, Two years ago, you do see them because the jumps or the vortex nucleation is, is more dramatic in Gregor. But in magnetite, I just don't see them. And I don't know why. I would love to see them. And maybe it's something we need to take offline and you can show me what I'm doing wrong. But I, I just wondered if, is there any <laughs> as... <laughs> I, I'm just puzzled, Ramon. In your experimental observations, are they with respect to randomly oriented particles or uh, are you? Uh... Well, I have only uh, fake <laughs> vortex particles. So my, my vortex examples are all based on single domain particles. And yes, the measurements, uh, th there is no anisotropy, no significant anisotropy. So we are not measuring along a particular axis. All right. But I think uh, maybe I'll contact you offline and you can help me out. Yeah, well, that, that's an interesting. But I have one question for you in turn. Do you think that maybe uh, thermal activations could play a role? Are, are, are these included? Well, thermal in your... activation, uh, I've looked at in terms of these uh, jumps, and they don't seem to make a huge difference. So, you know, I've done this uh, nudge elastic band across a, across a, a jump in a, in a hysteresis loop. And the energy barriers at the, at the jump are incredibly high. So one conclusion of that is thermal fluctuations shouldn't have a huge effect on uh, single vortex 
particles as compared to single domain, which is interesting in itself. So, but so I, I I don't know what the problem is. I don't know if it's a problem in my simulations. I don't know if it's a problem in our interpretation of the forks. But I need you know there, there's a puzzle there, and I I really need some help to unravel it. So so uh, I don't want to give everybody else's time up now, but maybe I'll. For, for instance, uh, uh, this simulation which was made by Johan contains spikes, which which points to sudden transitions. Uh, yes, yeah. that's right. So, and, and those were highly elongated grains, mm. uh, more elongated than I've than I've yeah. modeled. So that's true. A, a possible, possible. I mean, not 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 always. They win. I mean, the, in that paper one of the particles study was was a, a, a relatively equidimensional yeah. one with a, a single vortex state right and uh, it did produce discrete jumps which uh, produced did, you, uh, but you did you simulations though for the vort for the yeah micromechanism did you do random distributions of of because uh, i i my memory um, was in that, in that paper you didn't so if I do a single field, I think, I think, I think simulated in three or four different field directions. Yeah. Okay, because the simulations I mean, uh, I've oh no, in... probably here he, he he did the simulations. <laughs> <laughs> Johan, do you want to jump in? Had your hand up. I don't yeah. want to take over this if other people have questions. No, I was just going to say that we did this uh, by uh, simulating forks in different directions, um, and yeah, it was equidimensional particles in this in a single vortex state. Uh, and they reproduce perfectly the the lobes or the beginnings of lobes, like Ramon said, by showing the peaks of positive and negative signatures. Gosh, because you know I've I've done these now. So I wonder whether I wonder whether part of the explanation is it, you know we we've always tended to do simulations on on rather non-ideal shapes as opposed yeah. to perfect ellipsoids. Yeah. Yeah. Or, whether that makes a difference, I don't know. I don't know, but it is a puzzle because we've done these in, our, in sort of one millitesla steps. Um, and uh, in fact, the higher the resolution the field steps we make, the worse it is because the, the, the magnetization moves more gradually rather than dramatic switching. Yeah, but, but are you doing forks or are you just doing hysteresis loops? Uh, forks, yeah. Or forks. Oh, that would be interesting to see. I've got uh, 650 of them I can show you, but probably not now. <laughs> no, not now. <laughs> but uh, it's a puzzle, yeah, and I'd like to see, to reconcile the, the results I have with, with uh, the other results shown here today. All but right. There's a really nice explanation, Ramon. I, I, I really enjoyed that. Thanks. Rich, do you have one yeah. last one? Yeah, great. Great talk, Ramon. Really. I always, I always love your talks. Yeah. So just, they make me understand forks better again. <laughs> um, so I was going to ask about the, the bacterial chains and the, 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 the double strands. Um, so you mentioned that the, you know, the, the results of the Chang paper. Uh, can you go, yeah, back to the previous, one of the uh, previous yeah, slides yeah, where you yeah, show the, the yeah, where the Chang results plot yeah um this trend I mean, here yeah i mean I, I just went back to you know the, the paper that came sort of before that and and there we simulated sort of single chains but as a function of degree of collapse and mm -hmm. there for the most collapsed chain it, you get a value not so far from from the experimental value that you show there. So I think, I, I just wonder whether the exact trend that you fall on depends on the, the exact nature of the chain, like the particle separations and that kind of thing. Um, I mean, how universal is that, is that orange curve that you've plotted there? Um, well, yeah. I'm looking at the, uh, the values that are more like 0.4, sort of, they, they, they sort of fall on a slightly steeper trend, which is, for a partial this, degree of collapse, I think, you know, the, the, you, you can get the lobes, the sort of upper and lower lobes above the central ridge, start to develop before you get to a fully collapsed chain in, in, in that random walk model. Uh, and there the results would plot closer to, I think, your... Yeah, and also in the Forculator paper, the chain collapse simulations in Harrison, mm. 
2014. So I was just wondering. Yes, these yeah, points here, yeah. this point, for instance, is very close to the natural one. Yes. Mm -hmm. But then the question is, why should they stop here and not go further in, in, in randomization? Mm. So yeah. So do you think that this um, the double chain sort of signature that you're that you're putting forward is is that a unique uniquely diagnostic or is it you know can you obtain those values and that behavior with just playing around with parameter space for single chains with different degrees of collapse and different different particle separations and, and that kind of thing so the, these simulations i i didn't uh, add any type of randomness that was not contained originally in the let's say my um, examples that we get from the uh, electron microscope. So I just wanted to model the chains as they are. So this to say, this is not excluded that there are uh, changes in the structure of the chains that cannot be said, but what can be said with this study is that the original um, configurations can reconcile this value of the remanence ratio, which are close to 0 0.5 with the lobes. That's the statement. But if this is the truth, so if there is not another explanation, uh, because uh, as I said myself, uh, the signatures are non-unique, uh, it cannot be demonstrated actually. But I still think it's an interesting case that you don't need to make this chain get destroyed mm -hmm. to get the signature that you see in a natural sediment. Yeah, I think I think that's true. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we saw them begin to develop. So if you model it as a function of starting from perfectly straight and then adding more and more randomness, they, they do develop well before you get to fully collapsed. Yeah. All right, let's take one last question from Alexander Roth, and then we're going to move on to Clara. Uh, thank you. Uh, great talk. I took about a 15 year hiatus on fork diagrams. So I'd love to see that people are still doing it and making some great interpretations. Uh, I don't really have two questions, but I have two comments. And the first one would be, I work directly under Chris Pike and Ken Vera Subs lab and extensively with Gary Acton. And I have hundreds and hundreds of fork diagrams on various synthetic sediments, different iron oxides that chemists friends that synthesize as well as natural sediments. Um, I was inspired by Pete from the IRM when I went out for moss power training to build sort of a bestiarity uh, or whatever you call it, um, <laughs> to do the stamp collecting and have that. So I, I still have all that data. So I, that can be made available. And there's even some really odd uh, DARPA samples of uh, parallel semiconductors and just funky stuff. So there's a lot of cool data that we can incorporate into this. The second thing was, and it's sort of proving your point about the caveats with fork diagrams of the, 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 the danger of having multiple interpretations of a fork diagram. And my example would be that last mixture of super paramagnetic and, and single domain mixture, uh, we would have, I, I would have interpreted that um, as that to begin with. And that being, uh, when you have when you have a grain size distribution that spans the both, maybe not even two discrete populations, but just one where it, it spans that, depending on your measurement time, you can has have you as you start the fork diagram, it'll relax a little bit and you get these hooks. And so right along that ridge on the vertical axis, you get a really, really steep, steep drop, depending on how quickly you turn around the measurement time and how close to being you know, how, how fine the particles actually are. You might actually see them relaxing. And the second thing is when, when we had that problem, if we changed relax, relaxation time to where the hooks disappeared, that cliff disappears. And you got to remember the fork diagram, it's relative contours. And so if you have a giant peak on the one side of things, a little valley on that 45 degree that we talked about a, a bunch and there's you know, there's a lot of different interpretations on that. It will actually disappear. Uh, so I'm not saying that, you know, there wasn't some sort of oxidation going on in your samples, 
but I've actually measured identical samples that we interpreted as a mixture that the grain size distribution spanned some uh, barely super paramagnetic to single domain and they, they looked identical. So it's just kind of interesting, another interpretation of, of that same diagram. And I guess it's just mainly um, agreeing with the cot with the diagrams. So anyways, thanks for taking my comments. It's, it's I've been trying to make it to the conference uh, all week, but I've been, I'm in Iceland for IUP and it's been kind of a challenge. So good to see some familiar faces. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Um, and with that, I think we can transition to our next talk.